Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ben Kieser with Applied Flow Technology. And thank you very much for joining me on this uh, fine Wednesday, January 16th, 2019. I hope that you all are doing very well and having a wonderful start to your new year. I'm excited to be talking to you today about the top 10 AFT software features that you cannot go without. And this webinar is excellent because it applies to all of our software products, uh, AFT Fathom, Arrow, and Impulse. And that's one of the best benefits of using our software is when you learn how to use one of the software programs, you know how to use the other ones because there's a lot of crossover because the interfaces and functionality is virtually identical. So when you learn all these features here today, it doesn't matter which AFT product you're using, you're gonna be able to take advantage of all of these benefits that will dramatically speed up and enhance your full modeling efforts. Today's webinar is being recorded, and so that way if you're listening in live, uh, you can uh, go back and uh, watch me do something again. If I went over too quickly, you can send it along to your colleagues or you can watch it again later at your own leisure. If you are uh, listening in to the recording version, um, thank you for joining me. And just so that everyone knows, uh, it's apparent where you're able to find the upcoming recorded webinars, which is on our website, aft.com under the Learning Center webinars followed by upcoming webinars uh, in two weeks i'm going to be doing a webinar on the new features that came out with aft impulse 7 and there's several additional excellent webinars that we have scheduled the area where you can find our webinar library for the recorded webinars is right here and so when you go to the webinar library, you'd fill out the form and click on submit. And this is where you can find all of the various previously recorded webinars that we've done for Fathom, Arrow, and Impulse. They are free to access. So enjoy and uh, learn about all that additional good content that's on our website because there is a lot of it. Um, I have provided the PDF version of my presentation with the webinar handout. So if you are listening in live, you'll have that. If you are not listening in live and you're listening to the recorded version, then uh, please contact me at benkeiser at aft.com. That's B-E-N-K-E-I-S-E-R at aft.com. And I would be happy to send you my presentation for today's webinar. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started and let's jump into things. So these are the top 10 features I'm going to talk about today. One, model importing. We have the ability to uh, import several different neutral type, uh, neutral file type formats that will help you uh, be able to quickly and build your model. So they're very advantageous. I'm going to show you how to use that. Uh, we'll talk about global pipe and junction editing using the scenario manager, importing Excel changes, duplicate and duplicate special, design alerts, creating and using groups, adding graph list items to the graph list manager, Excel export manager, and finally, using intermediate pipe elevations, splitting pipes, and morphing junctions. So. Uh, these are all the various AFT products that are available. I'm not going to go over this right now. You can find all of that information about what we offer on our website. I'm showing everything in Fathom today, but again, it directly applies to AFT Arrow and AFT Impulse. So let's talk about model importing. This is one of the most powerful new features that we just recently included into Fathom 10, Arrow 7, and Impulse 7. What can we import? We can import piping component files. Those are, P, they have the extension PCF and they come from isometric drawings. So if you're using AutoCAD or Plant 3D or CADWorks or other types of drawing software that can create a isometric drawing, that would usually automatically create this piping component file with uh, various isogen standards and it contains all your piping information. We can read that file in and build the model of your system for you. 
We can also import CSER 2 neutral files, EPA net files, and of course we can uh, we can export EPA net files as well. Um, PCF and CSER 2 are import only, but the EPA net files can also be exported. And then finally, we can import <laughs> not GIG, that should be GIS, <laughs> uh, GIS shape files, uh, geographic information systems. Let me change this to an S. There we go. And so save that. And so this is uh, what it looks like um, where you or this is how you do it. You go to the uh, file menu and then pick uh, from this list here which neutral file format that you want to import. And it's pretty much as easy as that. So I'm going to jump into Fathom and show you how you do this. So here's Fathom. And the first step is to go to the file menu and then import piping layout. And I'm going to just do the piping component file. And the reason why is because the process for importing CSER2, GIS shape files, or EPA net files is exactly the same. So I would choose piping component file. The next thing that you would do is you're going to need to browse to the folder on your computer where you have your PCF files saved because you can not import more than one PCF file at a time. So I'm going to click on this button right here to browse in the folder on my computer that has that information. So it's on my desktop and then I have it in my top 10 new features, model importing, and there we go. So now that I access the proper folder, I have two PCF files available to me. So the first thing I would do is select which file I want to import first. So it brings up a paste preview mode of what the system is going to look like when it gets imported. The other thing that it does is it translates the object in the piping component file into an AFT object. So it's going to try and change a reducer to an area change or a valve to a valve or an elbow to a bed. Uh, so it's having to translate what these uh, fittings are into an AFT object. Now, this gives you a lot of flexibility into how you can import various uh, objects into the model. Let's say that this particular valve right here is not just a regular valve, it's actually supposed to be a uh, control valve. You can click on this drop down menu here and change it just like that. So, as you can see here, when I select the control valve, it changed this valve into the, uh, the control valve junction, which is this guy right there. So, it gives you uh, a lot of control over what you're trying to import. The next thing is that if you select on any of these objects and then click on the property window, this brings up pertinent information in the piping component file that's going to import and also help define some of the input information for that object. If you click on the show, ex show advanced properties, it contains several other pieces of information down here. Now, none of this information is pertinent to a flow model, but it's something that you might still want to import into the flow model just for congruency. <clears throat> so what I can do here is I can click on uh, this option down here to import the data to my notes fields. So if I click on that, all of that text is going to go to notes fields for my pipes and junctions, and I'll show you that shortly. Uh, what I want to do is I want to import my uh, junctions as actual junctions. So if you notice, when I toggle this box on and off, it's going to remove some components. So I want to show all my elbows as actual elbow junctions here. Okay, so once you get everything all set up and ready to import, you just click on import, and it's going to build the model of your system for you. All right, so everything's built off. For my first system, I'm going to import a second system now, and that's PCF file number two. 
this is really nice because I can click the paste to preview mode and I can drag it out of the way. That way I can place it wherever I want. And so again, if I click on this button right here, this is how you can toggle your actual elbow junctions on and off. So if you zoom in, you'll see where you have actual direction changes and 90 degree turns in the piping system. One way to model this is just as uh, a single pipe where you are neglecting the losses of the elbows. You're just making it look like your isometric drawing. But here you might want to still take advantage of including those losses. So that's where I'm going to import the, uh, I'm going to uncheck the box to import the elbows as pipes. All right. So now when I import that second model, it builds it really quickly. And once you are done importing the model, you would click close. And now everything's fully imported. So if I go to a certain pipe on the workspace and I open up the property window, you can go to the notes tab. And this is all of those notes that came in from the piping component file. So this is where you can find all of that information. If I go to the model data tab, this is where you can find all of your input information on a tabular format. So we are bringing in all of the length data as well as the hydraulic diameter and the elevation changes. So the elevation data gets picked up on the junctions. That's a significant amount of data and it's gonna save you tons of time. That way you don't always have to build a model from scratch if you have a drawing that you can import from. And then if I collapse these two sections and go to the notes tab in the general section, you can see all of the notes that came in from the piping component file all of this information can be printed out in your model data report as a PDF if you like. So that's model importing. If you were to import a Caesar 2 neutral file, GIS shape file, or EPA net file, the process is exactly the same. All right, so that's the first uh, thing I wanted to demonstrate. The uh, next capability that is really important for you to know how to use efficiently is global editing. You can do global pipe editing and global junction editing. What this allows you to do is you can edit massive amounts of information for common pieces of data all at once. So you can edit it multiple pieces of data for piping and mul multiple pieces of data for junctions. So let me go ahead and open up another model file where I don't have input defined and I'm going to show you what this looks like. Excuse me. All right. So let me go to file open and browse to the folder where my model file is saved. And this is the one that I'm going to do. Perfect, okay. So I've already built the model of my piping system and laid out all the pipes and junctions, but if I was to click on the light bulb, this is going to highlight, highlight all of the uh, object labels for pipes and junctions in red. What that indicates is that you are missing required pieces of information in order to fully define those objects. Now, in order to define your pipes and junctions, it's very simple. You just go in and you double click on the pipe. And then in order to define the minimal pieces of input, all you need is inner diameter, length, and friction model. Now, the key thing is here is if you were to select the pipe material dropdown from one of the pipe materials that are available, then it makes it a lot easier to just specify the nominal size and the schedule. And that's how you would define your pipes, and you would type in a length. Now, one thing that I'm going to be showing in a few uh, later steps is with regards to importing Excel change data. So what I am going to do before I import the changes from Excel to define 
Python junction information is I have to set dummy parameters. So I'm going to do that with global editing. So in order to massively input the pipe diameter and size and length for all my pipes, the way that you can do it is go to edit and then global pipe edit. And the first step that you would do is to select which pipes that you want to edit pieces of information for. Here, I'm going to click on all because I'm going to set a default pipe material, a default size, and a default type, as well as the default length. So I'm going to click on select pipe data. Now I'm going to choose steel pipe material. I'm going to do a diameter of four inches. Now here's the key thing is not every pipe in this system is four inches in diameter, okay? I'm going to change some of the pipes that are not four inches in diameter to other pipe sizes. I'm going to do that with my import Excel changes. So what I'm doing right now is I'm setting up default parameters. And uh, because you have to have dummy parameters, when you do your Excel import, you can't just import to a blank field. You have to set a value first and then change it. All right. Next, I'm going to do a dummy length of 10 feet. Again, not every pipe is going to be 10 feet. And then I'm going to show my nominal size on the workspace. Now, blue highlighting indicates required input. And so if I didn't have my actual input data in a spreadsheet that I'm going to import later, if you don't care about importing length, you don't have to define it. The reason why is because if you're doing a global editing operation, this window is only a template window. So even though that's required, if you don't care about the length, you don't have to specify it in that step. All right, so I click OK. And then this brings up a list of parameters that you can select in order to change them. So here, I'm going to click on All. And I'm going to apply all of these changes to the pipes on my workspace in the model. Now, this is where you have to be careful. <laughs> Global editing is very powerful, and with great power comes great responsibility. If not every single pipe is 10 feet long, then you don't want to just check that box to click all willy-nilly because this might change your pipes to a value that you don't want to actually use. So you, the, the moral of the story is you have to pay close attention and carefully check the boxes for the pieces of information you actually want to change. That way you don't have any unintended consequences. Now here it's okay for me to do all of them because I'm going to set the uh, placeholder values of 10 feet and then I'm going to change all the pipelines later. <clears throat> all right, so now all the pipe labels have turned black. That means the pipes are now fully defined. The next thing I need to do is I need to define my pumps as well as my control valves. My control valves are really easy. So I'm going to do edit and then global junction edit and then control valve. So here I would check the boxes for the two control valves that I'm going to change. And I'm not going to use a pressure sustaining valve. I'm going to use a flow control valve. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select flow control. And I'm just going to put a default flow rate value of 1,500 gallons per minute and zero foot elevation. And then I'm going to select, or I'm going to click on all to apply all the changes, except for the name, because I've already named them FCVA and FCVB. So this is where I had to be very careful to make sure I uncheck the box for the name so I don't just set it back to control valve. All right, and I accidentally chose to not display the names in the workspace. So there is another box that I forgot to check. There we go. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define my pump information. So I'm going to go to edit and then global junction edit, and I'm going to define the pumps. All the pumps are going to have the same pump curve. 
So I select the pump data. I would click on enter curve. And then I have my pump curve data all in a spreadsheet. So I'm going to select all of this data here and click on or do control C to copy it. I'm going to click on the table here and then paste it in. And I'm going to generate a curve fit. And there we go. So I'll click OK. And I'll click OK. And so I'm going to apply all those parameters except for the name and except for the replacing the number and name with just the number. So again, those are the two things that I unchecked because I don't want to change those. And there we go. So now if I go back to the model data tab, you can see how I've got my default lengths, my default hydraulic diameters, and then I have also got default input for my pumps as well as my control valves. Oops, I did not intend to click on that button. Cancel out of that. All right. So that's how you do global pipe and junction editing. Very useful, but just be careful to make sure that you check the correct boxes to only apply the specific changes that you want to change. Be very cautious of always clicking that all button because it can end up with unintended consequences. So that's how you do global editing to save you a lot of time. The next thing that I want to show you is the scenario manager. So the scenario manager is basically a family tree where you can model any number of different scenarios within a single model file. So here's an example of the scenario manager of the system that I'm showing you of different scenarios I'm going to build out. So as you can see here, I have a family of scenarios where I'm changing the pump speeds, and then I have a different family of scenarios where, excuse me, instead of doing pump speed, I'm going to do a controlled pump set point. That way I control the flow through the pump. Fathom will use the affinity laws to calculate what pump speed I need to meet my certain set points. And then finally, I'm going to do a family of scenarios where my pumps are operating at 100% speed, and then I control the flow through my control valves. So I'm going to set up all those scenarios. The scenario manager allows you to model any number of different operating cases or system changes within a single model file. Uh, it functions a lot like a family tree. You can have multiple levels of parent and child scenarios. Data can pass from a parent scenario to default or to dependent child scenarios. So if I was to make a change in a parent scenario and the child scenarios have not made that change yet, then the change in the parent will pass down to each of the child scenarios accordingly. So it saves you a lot of time. That way you only need to make the change once, not individually to each specific scenario. Now, if you want more detailed information on how to use the scenario manager, I wrote a blog on it several years ago. And so if you go to our website, AFT.com, under tips and tricks, you can do a search for scenario manager. And when you do that search for the scenario manager, uh, the two articles that I wrote are the ones down here. How many models of the same system do you have? And then defining and running 12 scenarios in less than 10 minutes. Those are excellent blog articles to read if you want to learn more about the scenario manager and how to use it effectively. But I'm going to jump into the example now. So let me pull my Fathom model back up. So here, I'm going to create uh, this scenario tree for you. So let me move my PowerPoint out of the way. All right, so here's how you do it. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a child scenario. I'm going to call it pump speed cases, FCVs, 
fully open. So there's my new parent scenario. <coughs> now, the reason why I did this is because when I get to the point of creating my second family of scenarios, which is this set right here, you can't clone the base scenario. So I clone or I create one parent with its children, and then I can clone the whole family. <laughs> uh, it could be a little scary if you're cloning families all the time, but in the software here, it works great. So the first scenario that I'm going to create is going to be called 95% speed. And then I'm going to select this parent scenario and I'm going to create another child called 90% speed. And then finally, I'm going to create one more child scenario and call it 85%. Speed. Now, what I would do is in this parent scenario for pump speed cases, I would do a global edit to set each of these pumps to operate at 100% speed. So here, the default option for your pump is to automatically run them at 100% speed. So when you specify a pump curve, immediately if you don't change anything here, your pump is gonna operate at 100% speed. So the reason why I'm setting up this scenario tree is because I'm gonna use the Excel change import to automatically populate these three scenarios with new speed data. So when I import my changes from Excel that you'll see here in a little bit, in this particular scenario, it's going to change each of these three pumps to operate at 85% speed. So that way, you don't have to go in and individually change the pump speed for each of these scenarios. You can do that super easily with a import Excel change. All right, so I created my first family of scenarios. And what I'm going to make sure I do here is for my two flow control valves, I'm going to fail them open. That way they are not controlling at their set points. The reason for this is because I'm controlling the flow through my system by changing the pump speed on the VFDs, not the control valves. So that's why I'm failing open those control valves like they're not even there. So now what I wanna do is I wanna create the next family of scenarios. Here's how you can do that, is you can select the parent scenario and then right click and you can do clone with children. So this is where I'm gonna clone this second scenario with its children and I'm gonna modify the name. So this is gonna be called pump set point cases, FCVs fully open. So here's what that does. I expanded my entire family with this new set of scenarios right here. So what I need to do is I want these scenarios to operate based upon a controlled pump set point at a flow rate. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna change my, the names. So this scenario is going to be called uh, 500 GPM per pump. And then this scenario will be called 400 GPM per pump. And then finally, this one will be called 300 GPM per pump. Now, again, I do not have to load any of these individual scenarios to make the changes to the pumps because I'm gonna import all those changes from a spreadsheet in the next few minutes here. So I'm going to double click and load this parent scenario, pump set point cases, FCVs fully open. So what I'm gonna do here is in order to change the child scenarios to a controlled set point, I have to set the pumps in the parent scenario from speed to controlled set point. So I'm gonna do that with a global edit. So I go to edit and then global junction edit and then pump and I'm gonna click on all, and the only thing I need to do is just go to variable speed, 
and change it to controlled pump set point. So I'm going to set a default value of 500 gallons per minute. As you can see, not every scenario is operating at 500. That's fine. This is just a default value so that I can change this field later in these other scenarios. So I set up my parameter, click OK. The only box that I'm going to change is this one right here. Pump control, 500 gallons per minute. Apply the selections and click OK. So now if I right click, I can see that I'm using pump control. 500 gallons per minute. If I load this bottom scenario, you can see here that the change I made at the parent propagated down to this child, so this pump right here is also using 500 gallons per minute. That saves me a ton of time where I only needed to make the change once. I'll expand on my scenarios. Now, I'm going to do one more cloning operation. I'm gonna right click this parent, I'm going to select clone with children, and I'm going to do my last family. 100, this is going to be called 100% speed dash FCV set point changes. And so now I'm going to change these names here. So this is going to be called 1500 GPM per FCV, and then I'll have 1250 GPM per FCV. And then finally, this will be called 1000, oops, one more zero, GPM per FCV. There we go. Okay, so in this scenario, <coughs> These three pumps here are operating on my controlled pump set point because it inherited that data when I cloned it from this previous family. So what I need to do in this parent right here is I need to do another global junction. I have to set these three pumps back to 100% speed. Really easy. Edit, global junction edit, and then pumps, and then click all. And then as you can see here, the, very, the default speed is just 100. And so I check the box for 100, apply the selections. And then next is for these two flow control valves, I'm going to select both of them. And then as you can see here, this option is enabled for special conditions. I'm going to toggle that off. So this circle with a slash to it, it toggles the special condition on the optional tab. So here I had fully open control. When I unchecked it, I set it back to none. That way, in this family of scenarios right here, I'm controlling my flow right now through my control valves. So that's how you can do your scenario manager by creating scenarios, cloning scenarios, etc. If you read those two blog articles that I pointed out, it'll give you a lot more detail and guidance on how to use those uh, different parameters in there. This leads me into the next step for the next feature, which is importing Excel changes. So when uh, in the software, there's a uh, format for Excel where you can import massive amounts of input data all at once. So what we have done is we have created a template for you, which is a Excel workbook that you can start from. It's located in the AFT application folder where the software is installed in your machine. So uh, that's where the uh, Excel file is located. Copy that file and place it somewhere else in your computer. Do not open it from that folder because you don't want to accidentally mess up anything that we have made for you in the template. So copy that template and paste it somewhere else in your computer. So here's what this template looks like. I'm going to do what I just told you not to do. 
I'm going to browse to where that template is located. I'm going to open it directly from that folder. Again, do not do this. Copy this file and paste it somewhere else. This is what the template looks like. It gives you some instructions that are important to pay attention to. And this is the new format with our latest versions. Now, instead of having to go to the help file and get certain codes for what you want to change, you would just go in here and click these drop down menus directly. So I might want to change the control valve set point. As you can see here, the colors guide you. And then you would specify a certain number. So maybe it's control valve number two. And then I want to change my control valve set point by 5%. And so this is how you can modify your Excel workbook in order to import massive amounts of data all at once. So I'm going to close this file. I'm not going to save it. All right, now let me browse to where I have my example import file. So here the steps will be build the model. We've already done that. Set of desired scenarios. We did that. Prepare the respective parent scenarios for each data type. We did that. That's where I set up the controlled flow set point for this parent as well as these children. And then I did my 100% speed and turned my control valves back on for this family. The next thing that you would do is define placeholder values for your material size and type. We did that. And then we're going to import all the piping data from the spreadsheet. So another key advantage with this new template is you now have the ability to import changes to different scenarios. <clears throat> In previous versions, you could only import changes to a scenario one at a time. But now, in the Excel template that we give you, there's a column where you can specify a scenario where you want specific changes to go. So what you can do here is, when you're looking at the scenario tree, you can right-click any of these scenarios, and you can save the scenario names or the scenario path to a text file like this. This is where you can copy all of these scenario names into your spreadsheet to easily make your changes. I've already done that. So let me go ahead and open up that spreadsheet to show you what it looks like. So here's my text file of my scenario names, and here's my spreadsheet. So I went in, and these are all my parameters for the pipes that I'm going to change. So this is for the pipe length, and then I've got nominal size, and then nominal type, which is the schedule. I'm going to import those changes to the base scenario, because if I put those changes in the base scenario, it's going to propagate those changes down to all the dependent child scenarios. Next, I have my pump speed scenarios, my controlled pump scenarios. So I've got my pumps that are operating at 500 gallons per minute, 400, 300, et cetera. And in this column, this is where I specify which scenario each of these respective changes are going to go into. So all in all, I have 99 rows of data that I'm going to import into my Fathom model. So now what I can do is go back into Fathom. I'm going to go up to the base scenario here. I'm going to go to File, Import Excel Change Data. And then this is where you browse to where your file is located. Let's see, here it is. Now, as long as I wrote in the correct uh, scenario names to match what I had before, and I don't have any typos, then it's going to read all of those rows of data <clears throat> and change them for me accordingly. So hopefully I didn't have any typos, and I, I typed in everything exactly as I had it before, and that should make everything operate properly for me. So right now it's going in and it's updating each scenario. Ah, looks like I did it correctly. So this tells me all of the 99 changes that were made to my model. 
So now if I go back to my model data, expand my pipe, and look, it's got the real pipe lengths, and it's got the actual pipe sizes, six inches and four inches in diameter. Also, if I go down to any of these child scenarios, you can see here, 85% speed. 85% speed. If I load this scenario, all the pumps should be 400 gallons per minute. And it is 400 GPM. 400 GPM. And then finally, for my control valve scenarios, this should be at 1,000, which it is. And this one is also at 1,000. So, I mean, it took me probably 10 minutes to show you how to globally edit your pipes and junctions and create my entire scenario tree and then import my data from Excel. So it can save you massive amounts of time. So it's a really important feature that you learn how to use and get familiar with because it's going to dramatically improve your modeling efficiency significantly. I mean, if I was not having to explain this, I'd be able to get this done probably in five minutes. So a really powerful capability. If you're in the model data window and you have multiple scenarios, you can go to the model data window and then for the format, you can look at the uh, multiple scenarios. So here, I'm looking at all the changes from each uh, direct ancestor. And so here, what you would see is how uh, input has changed, which would be highlighted in green and uh, actually be the control valves here. So you can see how the two parent scenarios are at 1500, and then this one is at 1000. This is how you can see what is different across different scenarios. Another thing that you can do is after you get everything all set up, you can go to File and then Start Batch Run, and then you can add in various scenarios that you would like to run sequentially. You can do as many or all of these as you want. I'm not gonna do all of them, I'll just do the first two here, and then I'll run these two scenarios and then what you could do after you run the scenarios, um, well, uh, maybe I didn't import uh, proper input here, but that's okay. Uh, what you can do is once you uh, run your scenarios here, you can look at each scenario's results individually. So I'll click on close. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load this scenario which has output data. And this is how you can look at your results for multiple scenarios at the same time. You just go to your output control window, select the scenarios, and I'm gonna look at those two scenarios together. We'll color code them for you. And here's how you can see how your parameters change with each of these different scenarios. So here you can actually look at all nine scenarios if you ran them all together by doing the batch run. So a uh, really useful capability there. All right. Next thing that I want to talk about is using Duplicate Special. And so Duplicate Special is kind of a, I guess you could call it maybe a poor man's scenario manager. You can have multiple systems on the same workspace rather than different scenarios if things are relatively easy. Uh, what you're looking at. So let me open up a different model file here. This is a example that I have done previously in one of my, uh, you know, a few of my previous webinars here, where I do a pump sizing, pipe sizing, and tank sizing calculation all in one. So in my base scenario here, as you can see, I have three individual systems. And what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to size my pipes in order to maintain a certain velocity. So I want to make sure my pipes are under a six foot per second velocity. So what I did was I started with just one system right here. I built the system with all the pipes and junctions. Then I defined all of the input. So it was fully defined. I could run it and get results. But then what I did was I selected all the pipes and junctions in that system, and then I went to the 
edit menu. So let me show you what I did here. I selected everything just like this, and I went to edit and then duplicate special. Now, let me do this with the last system here uh, because I already did it, so I saw it. this system is four inches in diameter. This system is five inches in diameter. This one is six inches in diameter. So what you can do is you could do just control D on your keyboard, which stands for duplicate. And it's copy and paste in one. So that's control D, it creates an identical copy. But the issue is it does not maintain any consistency in the numbering for your pipes and junctions. So there's a better way to do it. The better way to do it would be to select everything and then go to edit and then duplicate special. The reason is because here you can offset your pipe and junction ID numbers by a certain value. As you can see, this makes it very easy to correlate how pipe three correlates to pipe 103 and 203. So when you do a duplicate special, it maintains a lot better consistency throughout your different systems that you're duplicating. The other thing that you can do is you can immediately create groups or you can link things or duplicate goals, etc. So uh, if I do a duplicate special, there we go. Now, this is doing something funky that it shouldn't be doing. And uh, it's a uh, nuance with the isometric grid. And it's an issue that I've not been able to figure out how to reproduce every time. And uh, so if it was just a standard two-dimensional grid, you wouldn't see that issue. But that's what duplicate special is. <coughs> the reason why this is useful is because you can run all three systems on the same workspace at the same time. So you can have completely isolated systems and run them all together. And that's a really effective way of being able to model different cases if you have a really simple, uh, a really simple situation going on. And maybe you don't want to use the scenario manager for that. So that's duplicating. The next thing I want to show you is using design alerts. Design alerts will quickly draw your attention to parameters that are exceeding various minimum or maximum value limits. It's very helpful for maintaining code compliance, and you can create as many design alerts as you want. So in my model that I have open right now, I have three separate design alerts. One design alert is to, uh, to flag my attention if any of these pipes here have a velocity <coughs> that is above six feet per second. So if I have velocities that are higher than six feet per second, it'll flag my attention to that in the results. Then I have two other design alerts for my heat exchanger flow rates. So I have other scenarios in this model where I have heat exchangers that require a minimum flow. And so I set up those design alerts to flag my attention if any of them are not getting enough flow. So here, here's what this looks like. If I go back into my Fathom model and I run this base scenario, uh, right now I'm doing heat transfer. I'm going to turn off heat transfer that way uh, it runs a bit faster for me. So here's my design alerts. I have my six feet per second uh, velocity. And as you can see, it is being applied to 15 different pipes. It's all the pipes here on the workspace. So when I have different pipe sizes, I can see that when I have smaller pipe diameters, obviously I'm gonna get higher velocity. So it flags my attention in the warning section and tells me which design alerts are being violated. And then it will highlight those violations in the output table below. So this made it really quick and easy for me to see that the four inch system and the five inch system are not gonna work 
I've got to go with six inch diameter piping. Now, in this particular scenario, the other two design alerts did not apply. So I did not care about these two design alerts in this scenario because there's only one heat exchanger per system. However, there's another scenario right here where I have pumps in parallel. And in this case, this heat exchanger requires 500 gallons per minute and this heat exchanger requires 350 gallons per minute for the design flow rates. So I've got an expansion there. So that's where I set up my design alerts right here to flag my attention if I'm not getting enough flow. So rather than doing design alerts on the pipes for those two, I did junction design alerts for the heat exchangers. Now, the pipe design alerts are still intact. So if I have high velocities, it's still going to tell me. So if I run this individual scenario here, you can see that you have velocity violations. Because I've got an expanded system, I'm requiring more flow through multiple pumps. So that's what sets my velocities higher. And then I can see here that one of my heat exchangers is not meeting the requirements. So it's telling me, Junction 204 is below my desired flow, which is this guy right here. So it's highlighting that right here in the results. I don't have enough flow. So that's using design alerts. Really useful also for maintaining code compliance. You can do as many design alerts as you like. Next thing is creating and using groups. So if you create groups, it makes it really easy to do a lot of different things. One example is it allows you to plot, excuse me, multiple flow paths uh, together. So you would select the objects in the workspace, go to edit groups and create the groups. And so this is how you would do it. So let's say that I want to be able to plot how the pressure changes along this flow path. And then I want to plot at the same time how the pressure changes along this flow path. So I have flow path one and flow path two. So here's what we would do is I would select pipes in a continuous flow path here. So that's flow path one. So I'm going to select it on the workspace, go to edit, and then groups, and then create and then give it a name. I'll call it uh, pass through top pump to tank one and click OK and then click OK. Then I'm going to deselect these pipes and junctions and select these ones here. Now note that if you want to do flow path uh, and profile plots, you don't have to actually get the junction selection. You just need the pipes in the continuous path. So I'm going to create a second group, create. I'll call it path uh, through top pump to tank two. So I have my two separate groups here. This is why it's really nice is because if I want to select a group on the workspace, I can do F6 on my keyboard and then do a select special to select all my uh, groups. And there we go. So what I want to do now is I want to go to the graph results window. And now that I have results, what I want to generate is a graph <clears throat> for the two profiles. So what you would do is go to profile and then under this drop down menu right here, that's where you would choose uh, the option to plot multiple paths using groups. So here, I'm going to check the box for both flow paths, and this is how I'm going to plot my pressure in both flow paths. And you can toggle them on and off. So here's one of my flow paths. It's t the uh, path to take one, and then this is the flow path uh, profile plot to take two. So this is how you can easily 
uh, select and, and graph multiple things together at the same time for different flow paths is by using the groups capability. And that's how you can create groups by selecting them on the workspace, then go to edit and then groups. And then you can create your groups. You can also do the group manager where you can individually modify the different groups at later times. The next step that I am going to show is how to add graph list items to the graph list manager. So there are common graphs that you want to file away for quick and easy access without having to constantly reset the graph parameters every time. So this is an example of where I have multiple um, graph list items right here in my graph list manager. And what I did was I right clicked on this graph folder and I plotted both of the graphs in the same tab. The graph list manager is a very useful filing system for all the types of, for all the different types of graphs that you want to work with. So here I've got my pressure profile. What I might want to do is add another parameter and I want to do pressure again. But for this one, I'm going to indent it to the right. <clears throat> that way, it is going to do the same parameter for pressure, but a different set of units. Maybe I want to do Pascals. And then I'll click on Generate. So here, I've got pressure that I'm plotting in terms of PSIA and in terms of Pascals. So in order to move this graph over to your graph list manager, you create your graph first. You can also change your formatting. And once you've formatted things however you like, you click on this folder with the blue plus sign, and then you give it a name, and that's how you move it over to your graph list manager. So what I would do here is I would uh, click on the blue or the folder with the blue plus sign and call it uh, P PSIA and Pascals, perhaps. And there it is. So this is why the Graphless Manager is incredibly useful because when I go in and I make any changes to my system and I rerun my model and get new results, I don't want to have to come back in and reset these parameters every single time. That's a pain. Instead, what you can do is simply double click on each of these graph list items and it regenerates them on the spot. So if you double click on them individually, it will create the graphs for you. And it also works with a scenario manager. So if you create a graph list item at a higher level scenario, or any scenario for that matter, you can access the same graph in any of the other scenarios <coughs> with the graph list manager. Now, as you can see, when I tried to create that second graph, it complained to me because there was something that I changed in the scenario that I'm in where this particular graph does not apply anymore. So keep that in mind where uh, these graph list items will be maintained, but until you change a system, you might need to update your graph list items, which is really easy to do. Uh, you just uh, load the item and then maybe you need to check additional boxes to plot additional pipes, regenerate your graph, and then you would click on the button in the middle and then you would update that existing graph list item. So that's using the graph list manager. All right, so we are at a hour and I've got just a couple more things that I want to show here. Uh, two more uh, features, actually, that are really important. So if you uh, need to head out, thank you for listening, and you will be sent a recording. That way you can pick back up at an hour into the webinar and you can listen to the rest of my uh, spiel at your own time. Or if you just want to hang in here with me for another few minutes, then uh, hang in there and we'll be uh, finished here shortly. And there's just a couple other items that I want to demonstrate that are really important for you to know how to use. So I'm going to keep going. If you have to head out, 
Thanks for listening. If you're able to hang in there, then thanks for listening. So let's carry on. All right. So the uh, next feature is Excel exporting. So uh, we have a brand new feature in Fathom 10, Arrow 7, and Impulse 7 called the Excel Export Manager. It is this button right here on the workspace toolbar. And when you open that up, it allows you to prepare various parameters that you would like to export to a spreadsheet. So what you would do is you would click on that button for the Excel Export Manager you would add various parameters and set things up. And then what you can do is after you run your model, you can export those results right into Excel. And so this table right here will give you an indication as to where data is gonna go in your spreadsheet. So it's gonna show you what it looks like. And you can do some really complicated exporting here. So uh, that's what I'm going to talk about is with this particular model itself. Um, if you read this blog article, it will actually walk you through how to set up the Excel Export Manager for what I'm going to demonstrate. So let me open up that model here. Excel Export, Complex. Okay. All right, so I have three different scenarios. Okay, so I made my model just a little bit more complex than what that blog talks about. My base scenario, I'm running my pump at 100% speed, and I have two other cases where it's at 95% speed and 90% speed. And so what I did was in the base scenario, I pre-configured my output with my output control here to only show specific parameters. So here I'm only showing the name of the pipe, flow rate, velocity, and pressure loss. And then for my uh, junctions, I'm showing these parameters. And then these are the five parameters I'm showing for my pumps, valves, heat exchangers, et cetera. This, in this particular model here, I'm not showing in my output all of the pipes. I'm only showing these six pipes right here. I set that up in this area through show pipes and junctions. So as you can see here, I've toggled off the boxes for several pipes that I'm not gonna show. This model is doing heat transfer, so I care about what the temperatures are at the assigned pressure junction. So I, I care about what the temperatures are coming into each of these uh, delivery points, uh, just like so. Now, as you can see, when I ran my model, I do care about temperature, but I'm not actually showing temperature right here. And then for my pump summary, this is the results that I'm demonstrating. The other thing that I did was I pre-configured two separate graph list items. One is for my three parameter header graph. If I go back to my workspace and hit F6, again, this is why creating groups is really useful, is because I have my main run and I am plotting these three parameters along that flow path pressure, velocity, and temperature. And I also have a pump and system curve that I am generating here. So I wanted to show that because it's going to make sense for when I bring up the Excel Export Manager here. So I'm gonna open up the Excel Export Manager and uh, here it is. So I've got several pieces of data that I'm exporting to a spreadsheet. One is the model title name. Then I have a column of data. So if I was to go to my valve summary, let me go to my valve summary really quick. So here's valve summary. Let me 
was not out of control. Let me pull back up my graph list manager. So a when you choose the export type as column, it's a column of data. So here I'm doing the name column of data, the flow rate column of data, and the K factor column of data. <coughs> those three pieces of information here are being exported in those rows of the Excel Export Manager. So you would pick your source. Where does that information come from? The Valve Summary tab. And the parameter that you're exporting is junction name, flow rate, K factor. You'd pick your units that you want to export it for. And then this is where you specify which Excel sheet that you're going to put it into. And then you would specify a starting cell. The reason why is because the Excel Export Manager will calculate where the data needs to go in the spreadsheet. If you were to have any overlapping data, you would see red squares in that spreadsheet. That means you've got data overlap that you don't want to have. If you click on this button right here, it'll show you what that data will come in like. If you click on the header, you can see how it changes, and now I've got overlap. So if I uncheck that box, everything looks good. Next, I've got piping data. And what I want to export is the temperature data, which is a column of piping output results for temperatures. So I wanted to show you this because here, this is how you can still export output results, even if you're not showing them in the output table. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. The next thing is my pump summary. Here, when you choose table, I'm showing everything that I've defined exactly as it is in the pump summary tab. So that's a table of data, and it's going to go somewhere down here, I believe. And then last but not least, when you create graph list items, you can also export that graph data as well. That way, your XY data for your graphs can go into the spreadsheet. Now, I'm going to change the name here. I'm going to call this uh, bed data. And then for each of these other uh, spreadsheet tabs, this is how you can name your different tabs in your Excel spreadsheet from the manager here. So this is what it's going to look like when it goes to Excel. You can put it into a brand new workbook or a workbook that you're already working with. And so here I'm going to put it into a brand new workbook. So I click OK. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a batch run. And I've added the three scenarios here. And I checked this box down below to save all my results with the Excel Export Manager. So after it runs each scenario, it's going to send the results into the spreadsheet. So when you have multiple scenarios and you're doing a batch run, it's going to put all the data into one Excel tab. So even if you set up your Excel Export Manager to have multiple pieces of data going into different tabs, it's going to combine them when you are doing batch runs. So that's something to be sure to keep in mind. So I just ran the first scenario. Now it's running the second one. And it's also sending all the results to the spreadsheet at the same time. <coughs> and then we've got one more scenario here. Almost done. And so now, after it sends all the data to Excel, it's going to bring up a little report that tells me how the data was exported into Excel and if it did it properly, uh, which it did. And so now it's going to load the scenario, and now I can open up my spreadsheet. And here's the spreadsheet that I sent the data to. So I've got my base scenario results, 95% speed and 90% speed. So this is really powerful because this is where you can do a whole data dump of several scenarios, and then you can format things and then do your own graphing. So I've got my uh, valve results here for flow and K-factor, 
my temperature results, my pump summary, and then this is my three parameter graph data and my pump and system curve graph data. So that's how you can use the Excel export manager. All right, last thing I wanna show is uh, intermediate pipe elevations, splitting pipes, and morphine junctions. So let me go ahead and open up the last model that I'm gonna show you today. So let me go back a step. And here it is. All right, so in order for Fathom and Arrow and Impulse, for that matter, to do the hydraulic calculations, elevation is required to do the fluid dynamics for that. And so let me close out of some of these other uh, files here. Uh, when you're defining your model, you have to specify your elevation data for the junctions. So in order for your pipes to pick up the elevation changes, you would have to use junctions like a branch junction here, where all you're doing is you're going to the branch junction and you're specifying the elevation. So in my system here, this is how my elevation profile is changing. And I'm using all these different branch junctions as well as several individual short pipes. There's an easier way to do this. And so over here, this is where I'm using intermediate pipe elevations. So instead of doing 10 individual pipes in all the different branch junctions, I have one pipe. And if I open that up, I go to the optional tab, and I'm going to check the box right here to use intermediate pipe elevations. And there's two ways to do it. You can do point to point or length along the pipe and you would specify how many intermediate points that there are, which in my model, there's 10 intermediate points. So I have my spreadsheet here where I created an arbitrary scaling for X and Y data, and that's how I was able to calculate my intermediate elevation changes in terms of point-to-point -point segment sizes and then length along the pipe. The length along the pipe requires just a little bit more computation because you are calculating a cumulative pipe length. If you use the point to point, you don't have to calculate the cumulative. So there's two ways to do it, and whichever way is easiest for you, you can use. So here, this is how my elevation will actually change throughout my pipe without having to use all the junctions just to give my elevation change. So this makes it really simple to still capture your elevations. If you plotted the pressure along that pipe, you would see how the pressure changes along that elevation profile as well. All right. So uh, that's the intermediate elevation option. Next thing I wanna show is splitting the pipe. So here, I have a situation where after I've built my model, later on I found out that I have a valve that is located in my piping system right here. It's between these two 30-foot elevation points. So if I go to my Excel tab or my Excel spreadsheet, let's say that the valve is somewhere between these two points. So let's say it's at 600 feet, okay? <clears throat> if you know exactly where your valve is supposed to go with, the, with reference to the total length of piping, then that's where using the length along the pipe might be a little bit more helpful, okay? So here I have my uh, bottom option, and so I'm going to put the, the valve uh, right between these two elevation points. So here's how you do it. If you hover over any of these junctions, you can see this hotkey for morph and split pipe. And so uh, what you'd be looking for is this. So splitting the pipe uses the shift key. That's the one I'm going to talk about first. So in order to split the pipe, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm gonna open up this pipe and I'm gonna pretend that I have a whole bunch of fittings in here. So I'm gonna put a K factor of 30 for all my fittings. 
and I'm going to hover over my valve and hold the shift key down while holding shift the whole time. I click and drag the valve right on top of the pipe. Now, you've always been able to do this, but now this is where you can dictate your, your uh, length split. So let's say it's at 600 feet. I can type in 600 feet directly, and that's how my split ratio is going to look. I can choose to put my fittings maybe on pipe B and click OK. So now I have two individual pipes and my valve right here. So this is my uh, upstream pipe. And as you can see, it automatically takes into account how your intermediate pipe elevations will need to be arranged when you split the pipe. So it does that for you. You don't have to try and figure it out. So it's a beautiful capability that's really useful. You can see that all the fittings went onto this pipe, and this is the downstream piping from the valve. So that's splitting the pipe with the, uh, the shift key. Here's how you can morph junctions. Let's say right here I am discharging into a pressure at 50 PSI. Let's say that that's actually a discharge tank. What I can do, instead of holding shift, I can hold the control key down. <clears throat> so I'll hold control, then click and drag the junction on top of the other junction that I want to change. So now, instead of using an assigned pressure, that's now a reservoir junction, and I can update my information. So this is maybe an elevation of 40 feet, and maybe I've got 50 PSI of service pressure, and the pipe is connected right at 40 feet. So instead of using a assigned pressure junction, I can use the reservoir junction. So the key thing is, any of these junctions can be morphed into any other junction. It's not just limited to only these two. No, you can do all of them, okay? So whenever you want to change a junction type, just morph it into another one. Okay, well, that closes things out for the top 10 features that you can't go without knowing how to use. Again, model importing, global editing, scenario manager, Excel changes, duplicating, design alerts, using groups, using the graphless manager, Excel export manager, and then intermediate pipe elevations. <clears throat> if you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to give us a call or send us an email if you have a tech support model that you need help with. You can send that to support at AFT.com. You can contact me, Ben Keezer at AFT.com, and we'll be glad to be able to help you. Thank you all very much for your time. If uh, you don't have a particular AFT product and you want to try it out, contact me directly. I'll be happy to set up a free evaluation license for you so you can try out all the bells and whistles for a couple of weeks. Thank you again very much for your time today, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your week.